No comment about Welcome to the Social Movements Lab. This is Michael Hart. I'm in Durham, North Carolina, and together with Sandro Mitsadra, uh, we direct the, uh, the lab. The lab is oriented towards exploring contemporary social movements and uh, the connections among them. Uh, in fact, we're often, our aim is often to internationalize the perspective on contemporary movements. The lab existed for three years uh, in an academic context in a uh, collaboration between Duke University and, and the University of Bologna. We were housed at the Franklin Humanities Institute. Uh, now Sandro and I are trying to relaunch the lab in a less academic context in a more public one in collaboration with Red May uh, and for, who, with whom, for whom we're very uh, grateful. By the way, if you're interested in this kind of this kind of discussion, this kind of content, check out the Red May uh, YouTube channel, which has which has um, many interesting similar things. I'd also like to uh, thank our media partners in Italy, Dinamo Press and Euronomide. Today's session um, is, oh, and before even the today's session, I just wanted to mention that our next, we have planned a next session, um, next dialogue, which will be on Thursday, the 17th of December uh, with Karim Makizi from Beirut about uh, the social movements in Lebanon that started in October, 2019 and continued uh, after and changed by the uh, explosions in the port in Beirut. So that will be at the same time on Thursday, uh, the 17th of December. Today's dialogue is about alarm phone and Mediterranean migrant rescue. Um, our format is for the first half hour, we'll be talking primarily with Maurice Sterle, please forgive my uh, poor German pronunciation, who is in Berlin. Uh, and so the idea is that for the first half hour, Sandro and I will construct a dialogue with Maurice. And then the second half hour, we'll join the discussion, uh, Sophie Smith from Arivaca, Arizona at the Mexico border and Enrica Rigo in Rome, Italy. Right, that's enough uh, for my introduction and I should pass to you, Sandro. Thank you, Michael. I'm really happy to uh, share this event with Maurice, uh, Sophie, and Enrica. The topic uh, we will discuss uh, is indeed uh, at the center also of uh, my own uh, activist uh, engagement. We will talk about uh, alarm phone and uh, Mediterranean migrant uh, rescue. You may know that uh, European uh, border uh, and migration policies uh, have uh, turned uh, the Mediterranean into uh, a mass graveyard. Just to give you a number, uh, uh, according to the estimate of uh, the International Organization for Migration, 20,000 migrants and refugees uh, lost uh, their life uh, in the attempt to cross uh, the maritime frontier since uh, 2014. This is a story that began at least uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, and uh, since the beginning, uh, there was uh, an attempt by activists uh, to organize uh, support initiatives uh, for uh, migrants and refugees uh, in the Mediterranean and elsewhere uh, along uh, the external borders uh, of uh, Europe. Nowadays, the central Mediterranean uh, is definitely the most lethal passage in the world for uh, migrants. But uh, activist initiatives uh, are uh, multiplying. They are heterogeneous initiative from humanitarian NGOs to more militant projects. And they compose a, a lively uh, picture of activism 
at sea. There is today in the Mediterranean what we call a, a civil fleet and uh, a specific project, uh, the Mediterranean project uh, uh, is uh, uh, part and parcel of uh, the activist engagement of myself and uh, of uh, my colleagues. Just uh, a last thing that uh, seems important to me, speaking of uh, activism, of social movements in the Mediterranean, as well as uh, in uh, other uh, border spaces uh, across the world, uh, confronts us uh, with a very peculiar situation. Because uh, on the one hand, we have uh, activists engaged in uh, migrant rescue and support. But on the other hand, we have migrants themselves. And uh, I think it is very important to uh, look uh, at migrants uh, in the Mediterranean uh, as uh, political actors. I think it is very important uh, to emphasize the relevance uh, of the stubbornness of uh, migrants, of the continuing uh, challenge to uh, the border uh, regime. Among the several uh, projects uh, that uh, I have uh, mentioned, uh, alarm phone uh, has its own peculiarity. And part of this peculiarity is precisely the way in which uh, it looks at migrants, considering them as uh, social and political activists and social and political actors, and not merely as victims as uh, the humanitarian mainstream as it. So I would ask, first of all, uh, Maurice uh, to uh, introduce uh, the Alarm Phone project. Thank you very much, Michael, and thanks, Zandro. Yes, uh, the Alarm Phone is a hotline uh, for people in distress in the Mediterranean Sea. Right, so it actually functions like uh, any hotline you may know, is that there are always people uh, behind it and ready to pick up the phone when we receive calls from all the different Mediterranean regions, right? So from the Western Mediterranean, from Morocco to Tunisia or Libya, all the way to the Aegean uh, between Turkey and Greece. So this project developed in a social and political context that was shifting, right? So I think we had to situate it in uh, the year 2011 with the Arab uprisings, right? So until then, uh, Europe had installed a very, quite an efficient border deterrence system or migrant deterrence regime through the help of authoritarian regimes in Libya and Tunisia and so on. But with the Arab uprisings, these regimes were crumbling and sort of new migratory mobilities and routes emerged. And so in this context, we of course then also saw more um, border deaths, right? So in 2011, the death count spiked um, and as a response, a range of activists, also families of the disappeared, um, church groups, NGOs and so on came together to think about what we can proactively do to contest this ongoing mass dying. And back then, you know, there were ideas already about sending a boat into the sea, right? Um, but then it, it failed because of a lack of resources. So we thought, you know, what else could we do? And of course, you know, the, the phone is such a crucial device for migrants on the move, right? It serves them to orientate in, in new contexts. And of course, it's crucial um, when you are in distress at sea. And we also had took a lot of inspiration from some individuals who were already doing some sort of private alarm phone for people in distress at sea. And I just want to mention Father Musi Zarai, who is a 
uh, Italian Eritrean priest who had done this already for years, especially for migrants coming from Eritrea. And you know, his phone number was written in the on the prison walls in Libya. And migrants would take this number to the sea and then call him up and ask him for help. And he would use their GPS position to alert authorities and you know ask them to um, launch a rescue operation. But of course, for one individual, it was way too much to handle, right? And so we asked him whether we wanted, he wanted us to sort of collectivize this and uh, political project. And he said, you know, don't wait another day, you know, start tomorrow. And we started to work on this system. And then it took two years actually until we could launch it. And yes, since then we have received calls um, for over 3000 boats in the different Mediterranean regions. And as Zandra said, what is really important is to think of these people on the move as political subjects, right, who enact the right to move and not as sort of passive victims. And when we speak to them on the phone, we see, you know, how they claim to uh, claim the right to arrive in Europe, right? And we try to amplify this claim through our actions. I mean, of course, I can go into much more detail, but I think, you know, I don't want to talk for too long. But I, but I do want you to add some things, especially because it's going to be, I think, very unfamiliar to many of us about exactly how it works. Just some practical things like, um, you know, do, do all the migrants have satellite phones that, that, and how do they get your phone number? Uh, what does alarm phone do once they get the calls? Whom do they call? Could you just give a few more of those details of the, of the of practical course. functioning? Yes. So, I mean, quite often people are surprised when I say actually that we can do a lot, you know, when people call us in distress in the sea. Um, so when they call us, um, you know, we have um, drafted sort of emergency protocols for a variety of different scenarios, right? Because of course the conditions of precarious movement are really different in the different regions, right? So for example, people from Morocco quite often had um, have you know all old uh, phones where you cannot generate the GPS position. This has changed over the years, but the good thing in the Western Mediterranean is that you have reception, so you can use your you know regular mobile phone. This is completely different in the Central Mediterranean where you do not have reception. So basically, what uh, migrants have with them is one satellite phone. So it's one satellite phone with which they have to reach out to someone. And um, so they are really dependent on this one device, right? And if this device falls into the water or the battery is empty, then that's it. They cannot reach out to anyone. And then also in the Aegean Sea, again, the situation is different. And it also depends on the sort of composition of migrant groups, right? We have a lot of Afghans, a lot of Syrians who actually have smartphones and who contact us via WhatsApp. You know, or Facebook. So, you know, you have a variety of different sort of modalities of movement and, you know, technological sort of support systems. And when they call us, you know, in any scenario, in any region, the most important um, practice is always to find out where they are, of course, right? So we always need to have a GPS position. Then we can um, ask a range of other questions. So, you know, what is the composition on board? Are there pregnant women? Are there children? Um, has anyone died? Is anyone injured? You know, are you still moving? Uh, do you have a rubber boat, a wooden boat? Um, you know, what is the engine like? Uh, what are the waves like? You know, all these sort of questions that we ask and that we can then pass on to authorities. But knowing that authorities often do not respond, you know, we really have to mobilize public and political pressure to actually get them to rescue. And as Andre said, sometimes we are lucky and one of the members of the civil fleet is out there, right? One of the rescue boats, like last week, where one of the um, NGOs was out there and they actually rescued three boats that had called us. Unfortunately, in one case, you know, the boat broke in, in, into bits when they were rescuing and six people, including a, an infant, lost their lives. Um, and so this is basically what we... What we do and you know we run this hotline 24 7 we are now about 200 people who um, you know are uh, members of this network and we of course also have 
you know, language specialists and so on, because, you know, there are a variety of languages that are spoken on this uh, boat. And last but not least is that we, of course, also give emotional support, right? I mean, the situation is often very tense. So they need to know that someone is there in solidarity with them, you know, and sometimes this sort of contact develops over days even, right? And so you really get uh, to produce a sort of relationship with people on the boats. Maybe it would be interesting uh, uh, to hear uh, more about the geography of uh, the other phone uh, project. Uh, put it simply, uh, where are these 200 people based? <laughs> I think this is a kind of uh, uh, important aspect of the project. Yes, so the 200 members are all over the place, I think in 13 countries uh, on both sides of the Mediterranean. So we have many members in Morocco and in Tunisia and then in various European countries and also in Turkey. So we are a very decentralized network um, and many come from, you know, anti-fascist, anti-racist um, sort of uh, networks and have these backgrounds. Um, others, you know, joined us over the last years and they come from different contexts. And we also have members who have themselves, you know, experienced and survived the sea crossing. And so, you know, there are sometimes really fascinating constellations uh, of you know, people who have done the crossing, speaking to people who are currently in distress at sea because they really understand, you know, what the situation is on board, yes. So we are quite a transnational sort of transversal uh, network. And just to maybe add what I forgot to say earlier when Michael asked about how this number circulate, I think it's very much connected to our presence in all these different spaces, right? And there are no border networks in Morocco. There are other sort of uh, migrant and activist uh, communities with which we engage and through which this number circulates. And so quite often, you know, as the case, uh, as it is the case in migrant communities quite often is that the solidarity works under the surface, right? There are migrant communities who circulate the number. Once they have arrived, they pass it on to people who still want to leave. And of course, we also have a social media and media presence and try to uh, circulate the number in this way. But most often it is really through, you know, mouth to mouth uh, uh, campaigns, you know, and like passing on the number directly um, within migrant communities. I had one more just practical question before getting to the theoretical things that, that Sandra and I wanted to ask about is, um, have, have there been any efforts to criminalize the work of Alarm Phone or to block its functioning? Or is it in some ways uh, in, in a different register that doesn't, that isn't subject to the criminalization of many um, humanitarian and rescue efforts? So I can't fully comment on that, but I think, I mean, there are not the obvious sort of criminalization strategies that are used um, as against the NGOs that are out at sea, right? Because of their, of course, sort of physical direct implication, they, I think, are at greater risk to be criminalized than we are. But of course, we also have members in very precarious contexts. You know, we have also uh, members in Morocco, who are from Senegal and elsewhere, and you know they are being criminalized just for being black while being in uh, Morocco, right? And they uh, face different sort of police uh, forms of repression. I think this is important to consider that this is not only sort of affecting you know European activists, but because of our network and how it's structured, it also you know runs down to other um, yeah to other places, and so. I think uh, for us, the, the issue of criminalization is of course always on the agenda, just because we know that we are, you know, a target, just because, you know, all the European authorities want to get rid of witnesses, right? And they want to turn the Mediterranean into a sort of black box. And so of course, for them, it's, uh, I think, a struggle to always find out about, you know, their own wrongdoings via us and via survivors and, um, you know, people in distress at sea. One of the one of the things that, that that Sandro and I wanted to ask you about um, briefly, even though it's a very large topic, I suppose, 
Um, well, I should frame it like this. You know, one of the, our practices in the lab has been with each movement to consider connections along three axes, a, a genealogical axis, like things in the past it relates to, a transversal axis, other movements in similar spaces that it relates to, and then an international axis of, of relations. And one of the things that's interested me a lot about, about your own work is uh, the, the image at least of the Underground Railroad in the US as a kind of inspiration for, um, for alarm phone and, and Mediterranean migrant rescue. I guess in addition to that, or I assume they, they intersect, the ways in which Black Lives Matter, especially in the last six months, you know, over the last summer, has for many, for you and many in the uh, involved in Mediterranean migrant rescue has been a kind of uh, symbol or inspiration. Yeah. So can you just mention a little bit about how that how that how that inspiration functions or or image or something like that? Yes, thank you. I think this is really crucial for our work, and we have actually drawn quite often from this idea. And you know this network of the underground railroad, right? Of course, not to say that migrants are you know today's uh, slaves, right? Fugitive slaves, but it's more to think about the forms of solidarity that we want to create, right? Which is underground in a way, right? But which is still based on the very agency of the people who are actually on the move. And I think so. The underground railroad for us is. Um, you know, we can we can translate it into the current context by thinking through all the different sort of modalities and infrastructures of movement that are, and of solidarity that allow for these movements, right? Because I think when we look at the US context, of course, fugitive slaves were not necessarily escorted to the North, right? Even though quite often it's portrayed like that, right? They had to flee, they had to have the initiative to actually cross at least to the Mason-Dixon line and up, uh, across it and into uh, urban spaces where then the Underground Railroad was actually in practice and de facto there, right? Offering safe houses, uh, offering protection from slave catchers and so on. And when we translate it to the present day condition uh, in which unauthorized and precarious migration occurs, I think we can draw parallels in that, of course, a lot of these people on the move, you know, they do not start their journey in Libya, in Morocco or in Turkey, but you know, much before. And so you know, they have shown the agency to um, get to these places, you know, to the Northern African um, uh, shores. And so for us, you know, the Alarm for Network takes inspiration from past sort of infrastructures of solidarity and sees itself as maybe one sort of pillar of a, a migratory underground railroad, right? And I think, um, and we had this discussion before with Sandro, is that it also does not end there, right? These infrastructures of solidarity move uh, down to Africa, to Niger, and so on, because we also now have a, a sister network called Alarm for Sahara, right? Trying to support people who are in transit, but it also moves north, right? So we have all these um, uh, support structures and solidarity structures within Europe, right, in cities, shelter spaces, uh, info guides, uh, anti-deportation, anti-detention um, networks and so on. So I think, yes, there are, there are these sort of uh, dialogues between different movements and different um, histories of struggle. And I think, you know, we have to foster this dialogue a little bit more. And I, I see that in the US context right now, there is this discussion between um, Black Lives Matter uh, protests and protest against the border and incarceration, right? Abolish the police, abolish ICE, right? And I think in the European context, we can also learn from these discussions about abolition because I fear that quite often it's not translated at all into the European discourse, right? We ha hardly ever hear anyone also in social movements speak about the abolition of Frontex or the abolition of border control. So I think, yes, I'm very interested in how these different ideas around um, movement, you know, in terms of social movement and migrant movement can be connected even more. Maybe uh, a last question, uh, uh, 
can uh, pick up on what Michael was calling the transversal axis, which means uh, the relations with the other movements uh, in, it, in Europe uh, and uh, beyond, of course. Uh, I think that uh, you already gave a very interesting hint, uh, speaking of infrastructures of uh, solidarity. Do you see uh, spaces of convergence uh, uh, in European uh, cities, for instance, uh, between uh, um, movements against borders, uh, uh, movements of migration and other social movements? Thank you. Uh, yes, I think there are some emergent sort of coalitions in uh, European context and one movement and one sort of protest is to try to connect what happens in the Mediterranean with what happens throughout Europe, right? And to also create what we call corridors of solidarity, right? From the places where people land, uh, so often in Italy, in Greece, and so on, and to, you know, try to support these corridors, which also lead them to Berlin to Copenhagen and elsewhere, right? And so there are um, some movements that are emerging, which are, you know, they are situated in a sort of wide range of politicality in a sense, right? From church initiatives to humanitarian actors to very sort of local initiatives to anti-racist, to no border movements. And I think these coalitions are now even stronger after you know 2015 when a lot of people uh, came to Europe and you know it was quite often a very a response to a lack of state engagement right so even um sort of welcoming people you know doing sort of first aid and you know pro providing some shelter was quite often done by movements and you know ordinary citizens and i think there has been a sort of process of politicization but of course also a very strong uh, pushback from the sort of political levels of the state and the supra states, so from the EU institutions. And so I think, you know, there is something emerging, but I think there's also such a strong repression, you know, that it's difficult to actually uh, produce this solidarity beyond sort of the, the nation state frame, right? But we are trying to build this also by working with um, um, progressive municipalities and some mayors, right? You hear, you've heard, I'm sure, of the Italian mayors who were very much opposed to the Salvini regime and are still opposed to the Italian government and the way in which they are trying to deter migrants um, and how they treat migrants once they have arrived and how they try to deport them. And so I think, you know, there are different sort of movements between mayors uh, all over Europe and also social movements. But of course, it really needs to be strengthened because the border regime is, you know, very, very much uh, implicated in trying to also separate these different movements. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Maurice. I think uh, that now we can uh, hand it over to Sophie and Enrica. Mm. And just for people who are uh, joining us after the beginning, uh, Sophie Smith is in Arivaca, Arizona. Enrique Rigo is in, in Rome, Italy. Right, and if there's anything to start that either of you want to pick up on on the conversation previously or introduce new elements from your own work, uh, e either, either, either of those strategies is good at this point. <laughs> Please, Sophie, yeah. Um, thank you so much for the occasion. This is wonderful to have a chance to, to collaborate um, and share our context. I uh, am always struck speaking with um, folks involved in solidarity work in the Mediterranean, how similar, how many parallels there are to um, the context that we're working with in here uh, in the remote areas of the US-Mexico border. Um, and I think there's just a, a few connections worth, worth mentioning. Um, and I have a few questions as well. Um, but um, I think one, one piece that's very profound is the style of, of violence uh, 
of state violence in terms of border crossing that we see here is, is profoundly similar in terms of a set of policies uh, that aim to um, divert uh, unauthorized migration into remote um, hostile geographies uh, where people may find themselves in uh, perhaps one of the most militarized and surveilled zones on earth, but still losing their lives by abandonment to the elements and exposure to the elements. And that's certainly what's been happening on the US-Mexico border since policies that were put in place in 94. Um, and a similar struggle to account for the scale um, of the catastrophe that's unfolding. Um, here we have estimates on recovered human remains uh, that are reaching up to 9,000 people since these policies were put in place, but we estimate there to be three to 10 times the number of deaths because um, deaths are happening by way of disappearance, precisely because of not only the policies that are putting people into remote regions, but the, the lack of uh, sincere um, uh, emergency services. Um, and so the relief work here also, I think we really, um, I, I've been working with groups for about a decade out here um, working within sort of a solidarity framework and also a humanitarian um, um, public frame and humanitarian relief strategies and kind of the, that language um, uh, to respond. And the relief has certainly focused on, um, on some search and rescue practices. We have had hotlines um, over the years. There's an active hotline. Now it's a civilian hotline. Um, that does some of some work that I think is similar to what to what you're describing in terms of amplifying calls for rescue, because uh, in our case we have a discriminatory emergency conventional 911 system emergency system here which forwards any and all calls from someone in an emergency perceived to be undocumented to the U.S. Border Patrol, um, the very agency that put that um, is is installing walls and 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 um, surveillance equipment to push people into remote areas. So perversely, people who are crossing the border find themselves in harm's way are diverted to a militarized enforcement agency. Ninety nine percent of their budget is aimed towards enforcement. Um, so. So we're tasked with amplifying the calls for help to the very agency that is um, putting in place these policies, which then creates a lot of difficulty um, around exposing abuses, um, speaking political truths and making demands on that agency for fear that it will compromise sort of the minimal relationships that we might have with agents on the ground. So I'm curious about kind of those, um, what, whether there's, there's a similar kind of, um, the tension between making ex over political claims and the kind of leverage that you might have through your hotline to to amplify a call, um, an emergency call is something that's that's really running through my mind um, because we're seeing for us border patrol response seventy percent of the time they they do nothing at all. Um, the thirty percent of the time that they do respond, they might search for someone for an hour at the most a day, um, which is just starkly. Um, distinct from if there's a, a, a hunter or a tourist hiker in these same areas, we see a 99 to 100% response rate and success rate from, from uh, local sheriff's departments, but, but local um, responders are overwhelmed by the need on the border um, because the county is getting like three to five calls a day. Our hotline is getting 2,000 calls in a six month period. Um, so anyway, I, I'm, I'm curious sort of about this. This leads us to do on the ground response as well, which then comes up against the kind of limitations around um, land access, having access to true resources like helicopters, um, and then also kind of the criminalization piece. So anyway, I'm sort of, I'm interested in sort of the tension between, you know, leveraging authorities and, and, and being able to, to make political claims um, in your context. Shall I get back? Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Sophie, for the comment and question. And I think, yes, there are so many similarities, right, in the sort of naturalization of migrant death. And I think, you know, I've been to the uh, US-Mexico border in California and also in Texas. And, you know, we see exactly how this sort of terrain is being used, this very hostile terrain is being used as an integral part of border control, right? And of course, in the European context, you know, the, the bodies quite often disappear in the sea, right? And if at all, they quite often only wash up in Northern Africa, right? 
And so, you know, it's always sort of naturalized in terms of saying, yes, you know, of course, it's just fake, you know, they were uh, unlucky, or it's the role of the smugglers that is emphasized, but never, of course, the sort of structural regime and the ways in which migrant mobilities are also sort of filtered in this way, leaving only these really horrendous and dangerous uh, pathways, right? So I think there are so many similarities in terms of how, and uh, in terms of spatiality, right? How spaces are being um, rendered hostile as a strategy of migrant deterrence. And so, I mean, for me, it's, it's also similar in terms of, you know, how it's not a matter of surveillance or knowing about these um, death at sea, right? And I guess also, you know, coming from like Black Lives Matter slogans and so on, it's about um, sort of over policing and under protecting, right? So also in the European context, we know everything, you know, like, I mean, we have had boats that we supported for days and they were monitored from the sky through Frontex aircrafts through a Maltese helicopter. Uh, but still, they were left to drown, right? I mean, how is this even possible? And I think, you know, Foucault talks about an active intolerable, right? And the question is really, how can we turn something which is evident, which we have made public, into sort of a political moment that then forces not only states, but everyone, you know, the society to react and in, in an indignant way, right? And so, I mean, it's very a difficult question because I also feel that over the last few months, especially since the corona pandemic hit so hard in Europe, there has been yet another shift towards a securitization of the border and even less uh, sort of empathy or, you know, uh, a sort of less empathetic sentiment in the European public, right? So we have seen how a lot of this sort of forms of border violence, which we expose, that survivors expose, that the NGOs expose, is simply tolerated on the level of the state and the EU, right? And so exactly the question is, what possibilities actually do we have um, to intervene when, you know, like everything is sort of geared uh, against you, right? And I think for us, it is, again, just by trying to, you know, create new and larger coalitions. So, you know, we often are in touch with the church, we're in touch with a range of good journalists, right, who take on the, the, the um, task, for example, of calling authorities and to asking difficult questions. You know, we are in contact with some parliamentarians and some other NGOs and so on. But I'm also conscious that, of course, along the Mexico-US border, it's a very different sort of political terrain apart from the sort of environmental terrain, right? And, um, you know, I've been to Tijuana and, you know, people who try to organize there also complain, you know, that they are very scared of, you know, the, uh, the cartels and, you know, and the influence of the cartels and so on. So I think, you know, it's, I don't have any uh, easy answers. And actually right now I'm a bit pessimistic just because of the experiences we have made over the past few months where, you know, we had to fight for every boat, right? And the authorities are just um, sort of comfortable in letting people drown. Uh, thank you, Maurice. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sandro and Sophie for this uh, very interesting discussion. Um, I maybe I will try to bring uh, some other into the discussion. Uh, one is about connection with uh, social mo movements. You mentioned many social movements. Uh, I wanna also recall uh, the connection, uh, at least uh, in Italy, with the feminist movement. The phrase, because I mean, I, I I am an activist uh, also on the side. It was very important, uh, the connection with uh, migrant women and the struggle uh, across border. Uh, it, it was a founding moment uh, in the Italian feminist movement starting from 2016. So I was wondering if uh, uh, these connections have, I'm sure I've been drawn also somewhere else. And um, 
regarding, and this is also important, an important point for me, because when we consider migrants as agents into, in the Mediterranean, and the, the specificity of women's struggle across border uh, adds something to this agency and sometimes uh, is uh, overshade or obscure and they are represented just as victims. Um, another, so this was uh, my first point uh, and um, the other question that I want to ask you is about uh, of course, I know that there has been also a new wave of support in legal activism, in supporting rescue operation <clears throat> at, um, uh, at sea. Uh, not just defending the rescuer who were uh, ac accused of uh, smuggling, but also in the disembarkment process, uh, in levering authorities. So I think that this has been on one side important on practical terms, but uh, for me, it's also been very important uh, for a new critical perspective on international law. So uh, we cannot just rely on the existing rule, not even on the existing rule of law, but probably we need to occupy also this kind of spaces with uh, new discourses. And uh, this is a question, but uh, also a comment because I think that uh, the word abolition, uh, also we regard abolition of border controls is very important. It could be an important leverage. So <laughs> you can maybe reply to some of this. Thank you, Enrica. Uh, so the first point was about um, the struggle of families whose you know, loved ones uh, went missing or died. And I think, I mean, for us, this was always a very crucial uh, part of our activism. So I didn't mention it in the beginning, but, you know, two years before we actually launched it, you know, we came together in Italy and in Tunisia as, you know, a very diverse sort of coalition of NGOs, researchers, activists, and Father Musi Zarai was also part of it and also Tunisian families of the disappeared, right? So they had traveled to uh, Italy to um, ask the um, uh, government to release information on their loved ones, right? Quite often on their sons. And um, we also met families of the disappeared in Tunisia, right? And they are very organized and they are trying to pressure the government and so on. At the same time, of course, this is a really difficult kind of activism, right? Because it's always in this sort of space where, you know, death is probable quite often, but it cannot be said, right? And it's this sort of what always remains in between and which cannot necessarily be, be uh, made subject or, you know, made clear uh, because it always, of course, haunts the families. And so like to work with that who are quite in this state of uh, being frozen uh, through grief and so on is very difficult you know and i've seen a lot of activists try and you know sort of fail also you know and i think we have to keep this in mind that this is a, a burden for families for and for those who try to be in support but at the same time i think you know this is a crucial aspect of border activism is right is to think of course about um, sort of criminal or legal steps to think about who the uh, responsible you know, institutions and authorities are. But at the same time, it is about direct support of people who are suffering from you know, loss. And I think here we are trying to build something that we refer to as commemoration. So commemoration and action, right? And we have um, done this over a few years already where we try to get different families um, together from across different countries, you know, from Niger to Senegal, to Tunisia, to Morocco, to Italy, and so on, because of course relatives also live throughout Europe, and to, you know, create um, spaces where we can collectively commemorate and also protest uh, these, you know, 
death at the borders or what we call also forced disappearances, right? And these um, moments have proven to be very powerful, you know, powerful for the families and everyone who was a part of it. And also, um, you know, families from uh, South America were part of this. And I think these coalitions are really beautiful, right? And they speak a, a, a language of suffering, but also of resilience and of resistance, right? And I think for us, this is um, something that we definitely want to pursue in one case in particular where um, over 90 people, many from Sudan went missing last February and none of the official authorities, also none of the uh, international migration managers really recognized the shipwreck until today. But we are in touch with many of the families and they themselves want to you know, organize a sort of commemoration. And so we try to support it and turn it into a larger event across different uh, countries and continents. So, um, and then you, you spoke about strategic, um, the use of law, right? And I don't want to speak for too long, but I think, yes, we have to also be very creative with law, right? We see that states are very, very creative with their lawfare against NGOs. And it is of course only intended to prevent them from actually going out, right? I mean, none of the NGOs who was criminalized has ever you know, had a sentence, right? It dragged on for years, it cost a lot of money, and during this time, they were not allowed to go out at sea and rescue, right? This is the sort of legal strategy of states. So we have to like think creatively around how we can also use the law, right? And so, for example, in terms of strategic litigation, we of course work on reconstruction, you know, forms of violence, pushback, and so on through the accounts of survivors. But also we work with uh, strategic litigation in the instance of a distress case, right? So we had one, a couple of cases actually, where a woman on board uh, of a boat in distress that was not rescued, although it was in the Maltese search and rescue zone, gave one of our friends the power of attorney, right? Uh, from the boat, and which is, a, I think, also a very powerful act. And then um, Rule 39 was used in the European Court of Human Rights. And it didn't work in the way we had, of course, hoped for. But, you know, we are elaborating on like legal strategies while also, you know, seeing them as part of our practical struggles. Um, so I think I'll leave it here. I'd love to say one thing about in response about um, the role of families that we experienced here as well of the disappeared. And I think um, I, I think that the role of families needs to be overstated <laughs> much more than it is. And um, we find that most people who are crossing the border here and come into distress uh, call a family member before they call official authorities for, for assistance. And most of the people who call our hotlines are family members of the disappeared who are advocating or going out to search themselves. And we've seen a growth of family led search and rescue groups coming out of San Diego in particular. Um, and I think that that form of political organization among families is, is, is critical in, in revealing families as first responders, I think in many ways much more active than the, the louder relief organizations with a very public face. Um, and it to me throws into relief sort of a necessity to understand movement beyond organization. Um, the role of organization to provide perhaps a vernacular and a set of material recess, resources that can allow for the movement of families to mobilize whether they do so above or below the radar, um, I think is really critical. Um, there are ways in which the humanitarian framing sort of locks out um, a set of uh, approaches or understandings by, by families that are um, truly from the ground and, and, and informal. Um, and often much more um, uh, direct and effective than anything that, that we accomplish. And so I think there's a, a real tension in our work to make sure that we're making resources that can be taken away from the organization and used by families and also in our um, work in, in legal strategy to set precedents that can provide um, a measure of protection for families who are responding um, there are so many people acting within this border context who are not acting under the umbrella of an organization. And that includes the real rural, rural towns along the border as well. And so I think there's a challenge um, in terms of really needing robust 
language and, and framing around our politics of solidarity and the work of humanitarianism, but also to make sure that the movements are not only like leaving open, but empowering the work of people who are informal actors within the movements that I think in, lot, in a lot of ways are the true population of, of the movement here um, to, to support survival and those kind of true support networks that people are bringing with them um, um, on their crossing. So I just wanted to emphasize that, that as well. I want to ask Enrico a question because you mentioned, and I wanted to hear more about um, the interweaving of uh, the migrant solidarity movements and the feminist movements in Italy. I assume Neo and the Dumeno principally. And, and I was wondering what, you know, you were saying it was an important intersection or an important encounter. Could, is there a way of describing in what way um, the feminist movements are, were, shifted or enriched or in, uh, changed by by the encounter or the uh or bringing together of of these you know of these two movements or rather two yeah populations too I, I, could you say a little bit more about the encounter and, and the effects of the encounter that's what i'm asking okay uh, thank you michael for this question because this is something i quite care about I mean, on a very practical level, I even said that for us in Italy, especially in Rome, it was a founding moment because uh, uh, non una di meno, no one less, uh, uh, started in 2016 and we had this uh, huge number of uh, women coming through uh, across the Mediterranean and asking for asylum in Italy. And so for us was very, and of course they were labeled as trafficked women. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a, a rhetoric that we know very well. And in that occasion was very important for us, the experience, the gene genealogy of uh, the feminist movement uh, against violence uh, to um, Re, uh, I mean, to rebuild the narrative, to rebuild a narrative of violence, so not just of trafficking, but of gender violence on the one side, also in asylum cases. So this was very important also as a legal strategy. And on the, on the other side, a narrative that did not reduce these women to victims. Uh, so since the beginning, uh, it was a very important alliance for us. Uh, and of course, it was a very in, in, in enriching uh, the feminist movement also to um, give a new, you know, a, to, to, to be really intersectional and also to re-signify the word intersectionality from this point of view of a common field of struggle against violence. So this is, um, <clears throat> I don't, I mean, I could go on uh, for long, but uh, this is the main point. Uh, and it was important also of course, to build the connection with women that were already on the territory, uh, especially on, we have a small uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement in Italy, and uh, is especially to um, form by second generation migrants. Uh, so um, Italians uh, of foreigner origin that were uh, born in Italy. Uh, if uh, nobody has a comment or question, Sophie? Okay, then uh, I have uh, just uh, a last question for Maurice. We didn't talk uh, that much uh, uh, about the boats, <laughs> about uh, uh, the civil boats uh, that are engaged uh, in uh, search and rescue operations in uh, the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. 
Can you talk a bit uh, about uh, those boats, uh, the organizations uh, that uh, run them in this particular conjuncture? Because uh, I have the impression that uh, uh, nowadays we are witnessing a kind of reshuffling of positions uh, with very interesting uh, processes of networking in which uh, traditional humanitarian NGOs uh, uh, cooperate with much more radical uh, projects. Hmm. Thanks, Sandro. Um, yes, I mean, it's a fascinating uh, sort of story, short history of NGO engagement in the Mediterranean, right, since 2014. And so there is such a plurality in terms of the political backgrounds of actors. and. So it started with MOAS, right, which is which was the migrant offshore aid station, which was run by um, or was founded by two individuals who I would say are, you know, were involved in sort of security, the security industry, right, and the private insurance business and had generated a lot of money and were not very critical of the state, right, they were actually very much involved just in uh, in terms of, you know, producing this humanitarian narrative, but absolutely depoliticizing migration, right? And then over the years, we have seen a range of other actors emerge on the scene with very different political positionalities, but quite often that sort of um, influenced one another, right? And I do agree that we have now a range of actors who are really critical of the European border regime, who situate migrant death at sea in a sort of structural critique of, of violence. And, um, you know, of course, Mediterranea, uh, Sea-Watch, and also Airborne, the Airborne Division of Sea-Watch, right, which is now surveilling, sort of counter-surveilling the airspace of the coast of Libya as a sort of no-border air force, right, has really sort of changed the dynamics in the Mediterranean and sort of the antagonisms that you know, NGOs are um, sort of putting forward, right? Because it is also a reaction to this form of state criminalization that they have experienced for years, right? So you know, they were in the beginning, some of the NGOs were sort of offering their services to the state, but then also realized actually the state is trying to obstruct them at every turn. And so I think there has been this process of radicalization through the experience of being um, criminalized and harassed and obstructed at every turn, right? So I think the uh, civil fleet now is really crucial. And it, what always amazes me is that, you know, there is a cre creativity to it, right? As I said earlier, there are all these like creative strategies of states to, um, you know, obstruct them. At the same time, you know, there are all these sort of solidarities and exchanges between NGOs and other networks that would, you know, allow them again to go out at sea, right? And they get new boats, right? They get new aircrafts. And we had now the Luis Michel, which was uh, the boat funded by Banksy, right? So we, uh, you know, that was really um, sort of addressing the lack of a speedy boat in the, in, in the Mediterranean region, right? So really adjusting to what was needed in terms of material capabilities. And so I think, yes, the struggle is definitely not over and we will continue and there will be new boats coming. And, you know, I think this process is, is quite empowering, you know, despite all the attempts by states to, you know, turn the Mediterranean again into this sort of black box. I mean, I have a question, oh, is a comment and a question that uh, this uh, on uh, the civil fleet that Sandro um, was just mentioning and you were explaining, because I was reading uh, the annex uh, on the rescue operation attached uh, to the new European migration uh, pact. And actually, 
the annex says that a new form of search and rescue operation uh, is arising and it refers exactly uh, about the uh, NGO operations. So I think uh, on the one side, this is a recognition. On the other side, uh, the annex uh, underlines once again the necessity of differentiating rescuers by from smugglers uh, that has also to do with uh, the criminalization issue that Michael uh, was bringing up. And um, so I just want to know your opinion about that, uh, because uh, I think uh, is a is a very um, you know, a, a distinction uh, that is very problematic, uh, the distinction uh, in a, when it comes in practical terms. Uh, and um, I don't even, I'm not even sure that I want to make uh, this distinction. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, not to make this distinction uh, implies also to to, to, to make a step forward in terms of uh, radicalizing the struggle uh, across the border. So uh, is, a, is a question for you because of course uh, is a distinction that uh, easily turns uh, also uh, <clears throat> into a line between good and bad rescuers. So. Uh, sure, I mean, I think um, we see in the European context, you know, always this attempt to co-opt uh, NGOs, right, in terms of basically in a, on a discursive level, you know, by the EU institutions. And of course, you know, they say a lot of things and, you know, they, you know, suggest, you know, not criminalizing NGOs as much and so forth. But in actual fact, you know, this will not change the ways in which member states treat these NGOs, right? So for me, you know, this is quite insignificant. I think what counts is to actually see state processes and practices at sea. Uh, and, you know, we see that not only NGOs are criminalized, but also fishermen you know, and uh, merchant vessels who are sort of turning into accidental rescuers. They're not allowed to land. You know, this speaks the language that, you know, like that we feel, you know, and everything else is just on this sort of European, um, discursive level which connects to the safe identity and image of Europe as a peaceful and progressive and normative actor in the world, right? Which of course is not the case. And so I think, yes, we have to um, hope for more NGOs that see, we have to hope for more sort of confrontational NGOs that are not, you know, suggesting to outsource, you know, rescue, because of course, you know, civil society is investing quite a lot of money into the civil uh, actors, but you know, at the same time, we all know that you know it, there can be 50 NGO boats at sea, and still death at sea will not stop, right? And so I think we always have to think more radically. And I think you mentioned this earlier about a sort of abolitionist horizon, right, where we do our daily practice at the border, but the uh, political horizon is a different one. It's a one of abolitionism, you know, where the conditions are not even there anymore that force people onto these precarious trajectories, right? And so we from the Alarm Fund always say that we are not a solution. You know, we don't want to do it for the next 30 years. You know, we don't want to be woken up every night through voices, you know, in despair in the Mediterranean, right? So we do it as a daily practice because we know it's still a radical practice, right? We are not uh, taking on uh, just a service that the state wants to outsource, right? It's very confrontational still at a point where you know, we just do the state's work, of course, then we have to, to rethink it. And I think the NGOs are also still very far away from becoming service providers just because they are just so antagonistic and this is just so unwanted to have them in these spaces, right? So, I mean, the future is very, you know, I think unpredictable. I think, you know, just thinking about the last few years uh, you know, you couldn't have sort of imagined that, you know, so many NGOs are actually, and activists and humanitarians are actually going into the space again and again and again, right? So, but I have no idea what will happen over the next few years. So I think that was really great. And it seems like a good place for us to stop. Um, 
I wanted once again to uh, thank Maurice from Berlin, Sophie in Arevaca, Arizona, Enrica in Rome. Um, wanted to point out again that the uh, our next appointment on uh, Thursday, 7, 17th of uh, December at the same time uh, about the protests in Lebanon starting in uh, 2019, of course, also affected by the explosion of the port. We're hoping also to help ourselves understand the, the uh, very complicated state of Lebanese politics and the possibilities for social movements there. And as I said, we'll be speaking with Karim Maktizi in, uh, from Beirut. Um, so thanks very much to everyone. Thank you very much also from me. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.